Okay, I think we're going to start so that we finish in time. Uh, thanks for sticking until the last uh, lecture, and it is my great pleasure to have Javier Gonzalez here. Uh, so Javier is the principal scientist at Microsoft Research Cambridge, and um, he was supposed to be here in person, but there were some uh, issues, uh, personal issues that he could, uh, couldn't uh, bypass. But we're very happy to have you either way. So thanks for being here, Javier, uh, online at least, and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, thank you, Mauricio. Um, thanks for the thanks for the invitation and thanks for organizing this uh, this summer school. Uh, I really wanted to be there. Uh, it was uh, some last minute uh, personal issue that kept me here in, in Cambridge. Um, uh, I really wanted to interact uh, a bit more with with you all. So please uh, feel free to follow up if you have any any questions questions about the uh, about the talk or you, or you 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 want to you want to you want to catch up um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work uh, the, that we have been doing here in in, in Microsoft in um, in healthcare um, uh, I want to uh, start with a general context of, of, of the type of things that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about in this one hour and a half and then I will uh, dive a bit deeper in some of the of the projects and, and ideas that, are, that I want to be to discuss. Um, so the title of the talk is Healthcare in the Era of AI. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of, a, of a having a, a title with a grand scheme of things. But what I really want to talk about is about precision diagnostics and precision treatments. And I, I'll give two examples of, of how uh, we, are thinking, we are thinking about that. Uh, to set up the scene and the, and the context, um, uh, this is a summer school about healthcare and, uh, and, and, and biology. And what is clear to everyone is that um, the demand of uh, healthcare services is growing. Um, every day we have, a, a, in particular in developed countries, we have a population that is, that is aging. And 22% uh, of the population is expected to have more than 60 years by, by, by 2050. Uh, we have new clinical guidelines, guidelines um, uh, 25 percent rise in diagnostics referrals in the, in the UK, um, interventions become more, more complex, and uh, we also have a growing uh, backlog of, um, of uh, patients to attend, and that, that was uh, in, in partially triggered by, by COVID, but there are other, other reasons for that as well. So on, so on one hand, we have this demand for healthcare services that is growing, but on the other hand, we had uh, a supply from the healthcare system that is always that is also struggling, uh, struggling to go. So we have a shortfall uh, in in health workers, uh, particularly in the U.S. Um, uh, we have some uh, budget pressures as well, and uh, some inequalities, and we have a, a loss of, of productivity as well. So if we put if we put all these together. We really need to rethink some uh, aspects of how uh, uh, healthcare, uh, medicine, and biology is, is 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 done, and how technology can can apply to make it more efficient and more accessible for for, for more people. Uh, so when we think on the other side, when we think about the technical aspects and the things that we can do, we can think about uh, data generalization and access to uh, uh, digital. Uh, platform and system that allows us to have more data about patients uh, that could lead to a, a digital transformation. And obviously, we have computing uh, resources and advances in, in, in artificial intelligence. So when we put all this together, the hope is that we could use some of these technologies to improve the way uh, healthcare systems um, work and ultimately have an, an impact in, in patients. So as I say, this is just uh, the, the high level uh, view and, and the context. And one thing I, I, I want to highlight is that um, uh, when you when you work in healthcare, it's a, healthcare is a, is a really interesting, it's a growing area, it's a place where a lot of these technologies can be explored and, and, and developed, but it's a really hard area to work on. Um, it requires a lot of domain expertise, it requires a lot of communication with, uh, with, with experts. Um, so I hope I can, I can convey that message with some of the a more in detail projects that I'm that I'm going to be to be talking about. So on one hand, uh, you can think about 
a lot of uh, innovation and research that you can do, but when it really comes to deploy that innovation in the, in the healthcare systems, it's, it's, really, it's really hard. And sometimes these two cycles are, are, are disconnected. Um, so uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, zoom in uh, a bit more on, on some of the things that I that, that I want to that I want to talk about today. And the first uh, thing is about precision medicine. Um, so what do we mean by by precision medicine? So uh, when we think about precision me medicine, um, we really change. We really are talking about changing a paradigm in, in the way healthcare was conceived and, uh, and applied. So if you think about how uh, drugs have been, have, have been developed, and, uh, typically uh, this has been done by um, thinking about a population of patients um, in which we test some treatments. Obviously this is an oversimplification, but uh, within a population of patients, when we think about a randomized controlled trial for a new, a new drug, we think of a population of patients, uh, some, some process uh, to approve a drug. And, and obviously, then when um, when when the when you, when you have a, a post-market analysis of how uh, the drug work, you see that uh, uh, obviously mixed uh, results in the in the outcomes. Uh, so this is more like one drug to fit all uh, type of type of approach, which has been traditionally uh, used. So when we think about precision medicine, uh, we are really thinking about uh, thinking. Uh, we are really thinking about how we can. Uh, develop a specific uh, medications for a specific for a specific patients, um, and and how we can use the particular characteristics of a patient to uh, find the best the best possible the best possible outcome. Uh, when we think about the statistics of this, this requires new ways of thinking about some of these problems, and it requires putting together not only new ways of thinking but also um, uh, new methods and new access to. Uh, some of the of the, of the data sets that, uh, that that I will be discussing discussing later. So when we think about our, our precision about precision medicine, and this is just an example of what I was mentioning before, um, we really need to think about outcomes for uh, individual patients or specific groups of of patients, right? So this is a, an example. Uh, I got this screenshot for for the Merck uh, for the Merck web page, which is a uh, large pharma uh, that has this uh, drug is called Ketruda uh, that was approved in a randomized in a randomized controlled trial because it was benefiting the response rates on duration of um, previously treated uh, um, uh, metastatic head and, and neck cancer patients. So if you see at the bottom of the of the of what they have in the in the report and this drug was approved by the by the by the by the FDA. So what you see is that what the analysis shows is that one in five patients are responders, uh, so they respond positively to the drug, but uh, four out of five didn't. Um, the big question is why some of those responded, some of those patients responded, and some of those patients uh, didn't 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 respond. And that that's still a, a a question for this particular drug and for many other treatments. I mean, this is just this is just an example uh, to illustrate how important it is to think about the particular response and the individual treatments for. For, for patients, rather than thinking about about how a drug affects a, a, a whole a whole population. And so I'm, I'm bringing this this analogy. I, I think I'm not the first one uh, uh, using it. So this is like a like a first atlas of Britain. Um, it's called the Anglia Regnum, and it was uh, uh, drawn by Gerard Mercator in 19 in in 1595. You think about this? It's a it's a it's a quite accurate atlas of the. Of, of of Britain, um, but if you think about it, you can you can still go I think to uh, to get uh, gas uh, on, on on the road, and you can still buy one of these books. Uh, this is from 2021. That is the Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, what we can call a modern atlas, right? So these two things, although the modern atlas that I'm showing here is way more accurate and it has way more information than the first atlas of Britain, um, it's still pretty much the same thing, right? It's just a zoom in in, in, in one particular map uh, of, of, of Britain. What we really want to think about when we think about changing the paradigm in, in, in healthcare is thinking more like the way uh, we think when we, uh, when we have Google Maps or when we have Bing Maps uh, that, um, that are uh, um, uh, application that allows us to put together many sources of information and to really think, rather than thinking about 
the a configuration of Britain as itself, it can really help you to think about the particular journey uh, that you want to take from going to A to B in the, in the map. And it puts together many sources of information, not only how you can go, but also the restaurants that you can find in the way, where you can get uh, gas or other things that you can you can visit on the way. So when we think about a personalized medicine in the context of healthcare, we really need to think about what is what, and when we think about the um, the journal of the the journey of a of a, of a patient, right? Uh, since it's diagnosed until the disease is created, we really need to think. We really need to think holistically about about that journey and we, what, how we can predict what is going to happen to to make it as 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 good as possible and with the with the best possible outcome. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, talk about uh, how we have been thinking about those two components of 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 uh, that tool uh, that could give us uh, a personalized way of analyzing uh, patient uh, journeys since diagnostics to uh, treatment. So I'm going to be uh, splitting the the rest of my time in in these two in these two components. First of all, I, I will talk about a project um, in which uh, the aim is to um, um, diagnose uh, disease pretty much with a, with a with a sample of of blood. And the second one, I'm going to be talking about real world evidence and uh, how that can help to improve uh, the way. Um, post market treatments are applied in, in, in a specific in a specific patient. So I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, uh, what I'm calling precision diagnostics. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is any any question uh, at, at this point. Please feel free please feel free to interrupt me if if, if you have any questions. I, I will be getting now into more of the details of the of the, of the thing that, that we have been doing. So if there are any questions? Just let me know. Sure. Can you hear me, by the way? I can. I can. I can see the chat as well. So I, I have it in a, in another screen. So if you write there, I can. I can. I can answer to the to the, to the question. Cool. Uh, um, so let's let's start with a, with a, with a project in which we have been working for a, for a few years already. Uh, so this is called the Antigen Map Project. Um, the idea is to learn how to decode the immune system and how to uh, learn from that to diagnose uh, disease. And so this is a, a, a collaboration between uh, Microsoft and, and Adaptive Biotechnologies. Adaptive Biotechnologies is a, it's a startup in, in, in Seattle, uh, and we have been collaborating with them uh, to build the type of diagnostics that, I, that, I, that, I'm, going to, that I'm going to describe. Uh, so imagine that uh, you can uh, you could diagnose um, any disease just by looking at a, a blood sample. Um, so that's pretty much uh, what the what the project what the project is about. And the reason why uh, that's possible is because uh, you can uh, do some sequencing of uh, the blood sample that uh, outputs amino acid strings. Uh, or what I will call later um, uh, repertoires of T cell receptors or TCR, and you can build models to predict whether uh, that signature from your blood and from your immune system help you to predict uh, uh, whether you have a, a disease, a disease or not. Uh, so a question that you may have is like, oh, why why is this important and why uh, this would empower empower uh, care and make the life of uh, both doctors and, and patients easier. You can think about uh, diseases like like COVID. Um, um, the, it, it is relatively simple to to test COVID these days, but you can think about other more intrusive ways uh, in which you need to uh, uh, that you need to apply to uh, <clears throat> to to diagnose uh, a, a particular a particular disease. And um, when we think about universal uh, um, diagnostics, we think about having uh, the same type of tests for pretty much all the, all the diseases that, that, that you can have. Uh, so this is about understanding the, the immune system. The immune system is a really complex uh, system that we have in, inside, or inside our body. Uh, in particular, we're going to be talking about the adaptive immune system, and we are going to talk about, about T-cells. And these cells are really the, the key cells that detect um, uh, whether you have been infected by a virus, virus, uh, uh, and, and 
they uh, are able to detect the virus that, uh, that has infected your body and produce a response that will uh, trigger the immune system to fight the virus and, 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 and basically not die and, 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 and be safe. So when we think about T cells, um, we have to think about very, very large numbers of cells. So uh, in each one of your bodies, there are basically billions of, of T cells. And the way you can think about them is as keys that could unlock a different virus that, that infect you. Um, so the, the way your body is producing T cells is, follow, uh, is following a, a random mechanism, a recombination of, of, a, of a gene, of portions of a, of, of a gene that you have in, in your body. And pretty much what your immune system is doing uh, every minute on your of your life is producing random keys with the expectation that some of those keys will be able to identify viruses that will that will attack that will attack your body. Uh, when you then when you have a virus that is infecting you, what happens is that your immune system is testing all these billions of keys to see if one of those can unlock the virus, trigger a response, generate more of the T cells that will fight the virus that is infecting you, and therefore. Uh, uh, get rid of the of the disease. The interesting thing about the immune system is that it has a memory. So when that process happened, uh, the T cells or those keys that were able to identify uh, the virus and fight it will have a memory and they they will be retained in larger numbers. So then, when you get infected again, your body is already prepared uh, to fight to fight the disease. If you think about it, this is basically the mechanism why um, this is this help to understand the mechanism of why uh, vaccines work um, uh, when you get the vaccine what you are doing is basically injecting in your organism something that will trigger a response in the t cells so you can have them in larger numbers uh, to fight a particular disease so when you real when you get the real in infection your body your body is already is already is already prepared so um, if we think about uh, uh, the data generating uh, process uh, for this adaptive immune system that we are describing, you can think about an individual that has a number of uh, TCRs, uh, T cell receptors, which are these keys that will identify the virus. And what I'm trying to represent in, 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 in my screen now is like, so you have one individual, each one of those bars is representing the counts of the different TCRs that you, that you have. Uh, so this is an individual in which, uh, and in which none of the PCRs have been yet exposed to a to a disease. So uh, if we think about it, uh, this individual gets a particular disease. Um, so two PCRs are able to identify the virus that is uh, affecting uh, this individual, is producing more of those PCRs and is triggering a response. And then once the virus is gone. Uh, the histogram or, or the bar plot of the TCR repertoires of this individual will remain something like what we have on the screen, in which those keys or those TCR that have been used remain in larger, larger numbers. Uh, you, you really need to think about this like a very, very, very sparse problem, where uh, the number of bars for a real um, uh, TCR repertoire is, is of the order of, of, of billions. Just, uh, just to give you an example, and I will enter later into into the details of, uh, of, of the modeling that we have been doing. Uh, we have a relatively large data set uh, um, that uh, we have been collecting in collaboration with with Adaptive. They they do the sequencing of, of this data, and to give you an idea of uh, the scale of the problem, we had to change from single uh, precision to double precision just to store the uh, ID of all the TCRs that we had in our database. So we are really talking about, about billions of, of TCRs. But coming back to the data generating process, this is basically what happens. So when an individual gets affected, some of the TCRs uh, are uh, present in, in, a, in a larger number. Now the same individual gets affected by all the disease. So what happens is that other TCRs are able to detect this virus and are expressed in high numbers as well. Um, so the problem that we have here is that obviously we don't know which of these TCRs are associated to what disease, right? Um, and that's basically the core of the problem when we want to use these signatures or the or the or the TCR repertoires to predict uh, disease given given a sample. If this is already uh, complicated enough, 
we can think about different mechanisms of uh, generating of of of, uh, of responding to to a decision. So what I what I represented there are now two individuals. One is a baby, and the other one is an older person. And if you look at the TCR repertoires of these two persons, you will see that obviously the baby has been affected by less diseases. So you will see less peaks in the in the in the profile of the TCR repertoires. And the and the people and the and a person that is older has been uh, exposed to more diseases, so you will see more more peaks there. But also, what I'm representing there in in is is the HLA, which is a human leukocyte antigen, which is another piece of the puzzle that we are trying to solve. Because what that means is that what what this what this molecule does is it selects actually what uh, TCRs are presented to your body to trigger the response. So we can think about two people that are exposed to exactly the same disease, and because they have different HLAs, and uh, these are uh, uh, the, your type of HLA, just uh, heritage that, that you get from, from, from your parents, basically the same virus will uh, make different TCRs to, to respond. So when we think about TCR response once you are affected by, by a virus, the response that you have is conditional on the HLAs that you have in your, in your organism. And also when we look at individuals of different age, we expect to see very different profiles um, because of the level of exposure that they have had to, 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 to diseases during, during their life. I just, I just want to mention that I'm mainly talking about viral diseases, but, uh, but a similar type of mechanism affects, uh, applies to uh, autoimmune diseases. Also, there are some nuances there and, and, and a bit more, more complications that I, I, I won't discuss today. Okay, so um, when we think about decoding the immune system and understanding how the immune system works, um, we're really thinking about a very, very high dimensional challenge, right? Uh, a challenge that is uh, about understanding uh, which um, few TCRs in the billions of TCR that we have in our organism uh, have been triggered by the exposure to a, a particular virus. So we don't know what TCRs are expressed, which is the cis, in its subject uh, for, for its individual repertoire, and this, this is part of the challenge. So what I'm trying to represent here now is pretty much the structure of the data that we have. So we have individuals that's in the order of hundreds. We have a TCR repertoire, uh, basically these are, these are counts of the TCR that we have. This is a very, very uh, high dimensional and sparse versus, uh, 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 a sparse uh, matrix. And then we have other metadata like the cohort where the samples were located, the age of the individuals, the HLAs, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the, at the end we have uh, the labels, which are the disease labels, and we have cases, cases and, and controls. So this is the structure of the data, and we mainly have two goals. One is learning how we can make robust disease predictions with uh, these TCR repertoires. Um, so because we want to, and, and I, would like, I, I want to highlight the, the word robust, um, because we want to make predictions only using the TCR repertoires and not the metadata, because what we really want to capture is the mechanism in which the immune system uh, is representing the fact that you have been affected by it. By a virus. So we can we can transport this mechanism across multiple populations. This is the first goal. The second goal is really to understand the role of the TCRs and HLAs in the in the immune system. And obviously the two the two are related because the more we understand the role of TCRs and HLAs and other and other metadata, the better we can build models that will generalize across multiple populations when 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 we when we want to, to do diagnostics. Any 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 questions so far? This is basically the, the description of the of, of the problem. And I'm going to get into the details of what makes it particularly challenging and, and some modeling that, that we have done to solve these two these two goals. Um, so I don't know, Mauricio, if, they, if anyone has any question, maybe that's that's a good time uh, to make sure that uh, everyone is following. Yes, there are some questions uh, here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can okay. hear you. Hi, thank you. This is really interesting. Um, I was wondering 
you're making the disease predictions by studying the T cells. Is there any link with um, stuff like protein folding and making predictions from the you know, like alpha folds and those kinds of things? So f from like the pure mechanistic direction and kind of like meeting in the middle. And um, so can you predict, for example, what T cells um, will be activated by studying the shape of the antigens associated with the um, disease, for example? I, so there was, a, there was a bit of a background noise. I couldn't understand completely the, the question. I don't know if you, you could uh, repeat it. Uh, sure. I was just uh, wondering whether or not there's any link with the work going on to model uh, protein shapes and interactions on the mechanistic side, so you can go from the antigen to predicting the T cell kind of in the opposite direction. Yeah, so that's a, that's another that's another way of, of looking into it. Um, so you can think about uh, how uh, uh, PCRs uh, bind to particular antigens, and you can even look at the uh, some sequence modeling about uh, about how to do that. Try to inject some uh, mechanistic understanding of how that could or what that couldn't happen. Um, actually, that's that's part of this uh, big project as well. Um, people are trying to run experiments to understand that. In this case, that's not something we are doing. Here we are just looking at the high-level statistics and the counts of the, of the TCR repertoire, but obviously you could you could get into, into that as well. And something I would like to, to mention is like, here we are only considering what we call public TCRs, which are uh, TCRs that are present in uh, multiple individuals. But that's only account uh, for a very small percentage of the of the unique TCRs that are in our, our bodies. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not talking here about how you can use that information uh, to predict disease. I'm only talking about how uh, the small, this small percentage of public TCRs can be used to to build to build these models. But obviously, those are yeah very, very good questions that are beyond the scope of uh, what I'm going to discuss. Cool. Thank you very much. There's another question here. Hi, I'm interested to understand how you model the different variants that uh, then you use for uh, the TCR repertoire. So, uh, uh, so you're interested in uh, understanding how the, the model uses the, the PCR to, to predict the response? If I yes, so where, where do you get them? Do you, do you actually synthesize them? Do you have some kind of... Oh, yeah. Of so, yeah, yeah. We, so, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of a partnership with, with, with Adaptive. Uh, so, they do all the, all the lab work. So, they have this patented way of doing the sequencing of the, of the TCRs from uh, samples of blood. And so basically what we get is a relatively curated data set of the, of the, of the normalized counts of the, of the TCRs uh, per, per individual. Uh, we also have sequences, but basically Adaptive runs all the experiments and the sequencing for us so we can, we can get the data. Yeah, and the reason why I do that is, I mean, they are building, I think they, they are building products around around this, and they have uh, actual tests that are on the market. For instance, for COVID is one uh, in which they use uh, some models to predict uh, COVID or, or other diseases. Are there more questions? Oh. I think we don't have more questions at this point. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's get a bit into into the details of the of the of the some of the models that we have been trying. So uh, so this is a this is a paper. This is this is not something that we have done, but this is a paper from 2017, um, in which something relatively similar was done. Uh, uh, so they basically built a baseline of how you can predict disease from PCR repertoires. Uh, the sequencing technology was different, but the idea was was very was very similar. So uh, what they do is is extremely simple. Uh, so they run a Fisher exact test to select the the TCRs. And if you are not familiar with that, that's something I will I will mention in a, in a I will describe in a, in a couple of minutes. And then uh, basically what they do is they select 
uh, what TCRs are significant for the for the response. So they do variable selection uh, TCR by TCR, extracting which TCRs contain signal about the about the output label, and then they run a, a logistic regression to to predict the to predict the disease. And that already gives a, a a really good baseline to to start to start with. But there are some problems with with doing that that uh, that, that I want to that I want to mention. So if we think about the the Fisher exact test. Um, so the Fisher exact test is a way of uh, capturing the dependency of two binary random variables. Um, so when you think about the null hypothesis, uh, null hypothesis is that variables are independent. The alternative hypothesis is that variables are, are dependent, and this comes to the to the, to the first um, uh, statistical test developed by by Fisher, in which uh, something you can do is um, you can compute for that. So on the on the left, what I have is a particular frequency table. Um, for one imaginary example, in which I have 11 cases, 11 controls, some of them got the disease, some of them not, and some of them got a particular TCR, some of them didn't. Uh, so that's the frequency that we observe. So when we question ourselves whether uh, there is difference between, or these variables are independent or not, something you can do is you can enumerate all possible tables uh, in which you change the assignment to those four cells, but you keep the marginals of the table, and then you compare uh, uh, the distribution of uh, the T statistics for that, that computes the difference between uh, having the disease or not, with respect to the table that you have that you have observed. And then just by counting, you can uh, compute the p-value and decide whether uh, there is a significant difference between uh, between these, uh, be, whether these two variables are, are independent, are independent or not. So this is just an statistical, an, an statistical uh, test. And if you think about uh, this statistical text in the context of what we want to do, you can imagine a bunch of individuals. All of those individuals have their uh, TCR uh, repertoires. Um, if you uh, look into the details, all those uh, profiles look pretty much the same. So some of those uh, individuals now got the disease, some of them didn't get the disease. So for those who got the disease, and we are assuming that all the HLAs are equal in this case, so we have those, those bars that are activated. So basically now we can compute uh, for a particular TCR, we compute the contingency table, and the Fisher exact test will tell us that this is a significant TCR that is related to, to, to the disease. Um, it will be significant and, and it, will be, it will be part of, of our model. So this um, uh, hypothesis that we are testing of whether, uh, in this case, the disease has an effect in the TCR that are exposed for that particular TCR is significant and it won't be significant for, for any other. So you can just run the test for, for, for the TCR. But there, there is a problem, um, and this is related to uh, the robustness uh, uh, issue that I was mentioning. I was mentioning before. Now imagine that uh, you have uh, a cohort of individuals with different age, right? And uh, you know that age affects the probability of having the uh, the disease or not. And this is just an, an assumption that, that, that I'm making. And uh, you know that also age affects to the to the TCR to the TCR counts, and the hypothesis is to test whether the disease uh, uh, is affecting the, the TCRs is affecting the TCRs. So this is a small causal model that I'm writing, and what I'm trying to do here is try to break the feature exact test when we have when we have confounding factors. Uh, so now we have our our, our uh, cohort of of individuals. We know that older individuals have more spikes, right? In their in their TCR repertoires, younger individuals have, have less. Uh, and now what we have is um, that the probability of getting the disease is higher as you get older. Uh, and that's pretty much what I'm trying to, to represent in the example. So that's why you see that most of the um, uh, affected individuals are older, and none of the babies had uh, uh, had the disease. So now the problem is. Uh, that in, a, in an ideal scenario in which all the profiles are the same, this will, it will be very simple to distinguish which TCR has significance or not. But the problem is that when you have a confounding factor in which um, the um, counts of a particular TCR 
are both uh, related with those individuals that got the disease, but also a confounding factor like age, we are you are going to lead to wrong conclusions and you are going to think that there is a TCR that is significant of the disease when it really isn't. Um, so you really want to remove the fact that there are differences sometimes between cases and controls that are due to other factors different to, 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 the, to the disease. So that's not captured by, by the Fisher exact test. And that's obviously a problem when you try both to understand the immune system and also when you try to uh, build uh, robot uh, models to predict uh, disease using, using, using the TCRs. And so now, uh, how, do, how do we solve uh, this problem? So, of course, one could build a, a version of the physical exact test that um, uh, factors that in and that uh, has a, a correction for the, for the presence of, of confounding factor. Or you could even think more holistically about the, about the problem. I really try to come up with a, with a general model for, for immunomics uh, that will help you both to understand uh, the, the biology of it and also to, to predict to predict this is. So what we have been thinking about um, what, I, what I have on the screen now is really another simplification of the, of the model that I'm going to describe later. Um, something you, you, you would really like like to see is to have a handle in how you can learn how, how you can control um, and, or, or relate different diseases or different risk factors or other variables that you may have in the data set in how the different TCRs are expressed in the individuals of, of your sample. So what I have here is, a, is an example with, with, two, with two diseases. And ideally what you would like uh, to be able to do is to identify uh, if the blue bars or the yellow bars are generated by one disease or the other, irrespective of the values of potential confounding variables like depth. And depth is um, similar to H in a way. Depth is just um, a measure of, of the quality of the sequences that you have based on the on the sample that you have. So you don't really want to fool yourself uh, by the amount of sample, that, the amount of blood that you get or the age of your individual. You really want to be able to control and to understand what TCRs are activated um, because of because you have the disease and not and not other uh, and, and not other and you were not exposed, exposed to, to other factors. Uh, so this is the, the the high level description of the model. In a way, we want to have a model in which we have different knobs that we could activate if we think about this uh, uh, as a generative as a generative model, so we can control all the, all the factors involved in it. Uh, so when we think about a good model for for immunomics. Uh, we think a model that should handle uh, large uh, data sets and uh, obviously large, large repertoires. We want a model that can make invariant predictions with respect to confounding factors, and thus will give us accuracy and, and robustness and a good balance between, between these two. And we want a model also to be a playground uh, to understand the immune system. Uh, so we want a model that we can interpret, that we can that we can play with, and that we can think about um, counterfactual outcomes for different uh, for, for different uh, variables and, and for different interventions in the in the system and a model that we could use to uh, generate synthetic data with that we can that we can understand and, and use to understand the, the biology better so I'm gonna so this is something that we put in archive a couple of weeks ago so you can you can you can look into into the details I'm gonna try to describe now, uh, how this model looks and why we believe it's a, it's a way to understand this, this type of data. Um, so this model is a, it's a it's, we have called it adaptive immune repertoire invariant variational autoencoder. So it's a variational autoencoder with a particular structure in the, in the latent, in the latent space. So let me, let me explain you the, the, the different components of it. Um, so the first one is like, um, we assume that we have J TCRs in its in its repertoire. As I mentioned before, we are only using here the public TCRs, uh, so J can be relatively relatively large. Um, now we assume that we have K labels of factors of interest. This can be like the two diseases that I have in my in my in, in my slide before, or other another or other metadata. 
And the way we factor this model is that it's a variation autoencoder in which uh, we have a fa particular factorization of the latent space, such that we have latent spaces that are associated to each one of the, of the labels, and we have a latent space that is a noise latent that is not associated to, to, any, to any of them. Uh, models like this have been published before, and we have a bunch of uh, references in the, in the paper that, that I show you. Um, all we have on here is uh, to pick up and adapt um, some of the ideas that have already been published uh, to the particular case of understanding the, the, the immune system uh, with some other uh, extra bits that I, that, I will, that I will mention. So this is basically the idea. So we have a model in which uh, we have on, is, is a, some supervised variation autoencoder in which uh, we have the, the TCR repertoires on one side. We have the labels and the metadata as the, as the supervised component of the, of the model. And then we have a particular factorization of the latent space in which the important bit is that each one of those components of the latent space is associated to a, to a, different, to a different label. The interesting bit about doing this this way and why this is interesting for uh, immunology uh, is because uh, we have two models in one, really. Um, if we think about it, um, when we think about uh, the probability of X given Y that we factorize uh, by the product of, of the priors uh, and of the priors for each one of the latest of the labels plus, plus the noise, we have really a, a generative model that goes from the factors that characterize the individual to the TCR repertoires of, of that individual. And we think about the other direction of the model what we also have is a, discriminative, is a discriminative model that allows us to predict disease given TCR repertoires. And this ticks a lot of boxes because this helps us simultaneously to make predictions about a particular disease, but also think about uh, how to generate new repertoires and how to understand how the different labels affect to the, to the, to the repertoires that, 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 we are, that we are looking at. So when it comes to uh, doing inference with this model, or this is relatively standard, uh, so you want to use the log probability of x, y, uh, uh, the marginal log likelihood, uh, because, but because inference is intractable, you will use the, the expected lower bound. Uh, when you construct the expected lower bound, you need to take into account the particular factorization of the, of the latent space of, of the model that has a component uh, that is the reconstruction error, and then has another component that is the prior regularization, right? So in the, in the case in which we use the noise latent just as the prior, in case of having a, a, a component that has a label, you have the prior that is conditioned to, to, to that label. Uh, so this by itself would be like a, a standard variation autocoder with a, a factorization in the, in the latent space, but because we want to make it supervised as well, we have another component in which we account for uh, the predictions um, that, given the latent space, uh, we can make about each one of the each one of the labels. So basically, what we have is a loss that has two components. One component that is the, the standard label el elbow with the factorization that I mentioned, plus these auxiliary terms that um, tells the model that we should be able to predict the labels given the components of the of the latent space of the model. Uh, so this is this is basically it, and the question is, well, uh, two of the things that we wanted to do was, oh, okay, we can we can obviously use this model to make predictions, um, given x predict y for all the labels that, that we have. An interesting component of that is because we have this uh, factorized latents. Whenever we make predictions for y, uh, those predictions are going to be independent of the other labels. Uh, and the other components of the model from which uh, that will be uh, from which it, it, and the information from those labels will be extracted in, 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 the, in the other latents in the other latents that we have. But a particular bit that I really like about this model is uh, that we can do not only the, the, um, the predictive dimension, we can also think about the generative the generative dimension, right? Uh, so the question is how we can use this model to create synthetic data and counterfactual repertoires. So we can think about an individual that got the disease, 
uh, given the individual that got the particular disease, uh, we can observe the repertoire of that individual. What we would like to do is to generate a synthetic counterfactual in which we switch the label of the disease and we look at the new repertoire. So by doing that, if the model has the right structure and under the right assumptions, what we can actually see is what TCRs are activated or disactivated when we generate this, this kind of factor. So this can really help us to think about what uh, uh, TCRs are associated to each disease and to think about uh, understanding more about the biology by, by playing that, that type of game. So I'm, uh, now I, what I want to show you is how uh, we uh, generate counterfactuals from, from, from this model. I know that you have had already a couple of, of talks in, in causal inference, so I'm going to assume uh, that these terms are known, known to you. And so basically, when we think about counterfactual generation with, with this model, we are thinking in, in terms of the potential outcome frameworks, um, where you think about the uh, TCR repertoire as having two potential outcomes. Uh, one is the outcome when you have the disease, and the other one is the outcome when you don't have the disease. So basically, you can imagine two different TCR profile repertoires for the same individual. One in the case that could be the one that you have observed, uh, the individual with the disease, and the counterfactual question is what would the uh, profile of the individual would be if you had, uh, if you could do an intervention and 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 uh, and change and change the label and, and make that uh, individual to be affected by, by the disease. Obviously, you only are going to observe one of the two in the in your sample, but the idea is that you can generate a synthetic uh, counterfactual with the model for the one that you haven't that you haven't observed. So the way um, um, we do this with the model, and remember that counterfactuals are individual unit statements, right? Um, so this has to be conditioned on the particular description of the individual that in this case is given by all the other labels that you have that you have in the model. The way you can generate counterfactuals with this with these models is uh, you first start with uh, the set of, of TCRs from the individuals and you generate the values of the of the latents. Um, and now what you do is you fix all the latents but the one that you want to generate the counterfactual for, you switch the label for that particular, uh, you switch the value of the label for that particular disease or for that particular variable, you propagate through and you recompute the counterfactual for the whole, uh, the whole repertoire. So in the paper, we have the description of why this relates to the uh, way counterfactuals are generated given a causal graph. Obviously, you need to make different type of assumptions about um, the structure of the model and which scenarios you can actually generate these, these counterfactuals, but all the details and all the theory about that is in the, is in the paper. So this gives us now um, these two models in one, the first one that allows us to predict disease, and the other one that allows us to have a handle on how we understand uh, the immune system because we can generate counterfactuals for the individuals of the data set in which we start switching on and off uh, the different the different labels and we propagate that through up to the, the, the TCR repertoire. You can take this further and you can think about conditional average treatment effect where you compute all the counterfactuals for cases and controls, you can do the overheads and you can start thinking about subpopulations um, uh, of particular individuals with certain characteristics and how the, um, the, the the profiles and how the and how the repertoires would would look for them, but I'm, I'm not going to get into to these details. So all this is detailed in the in the paper. So um, something we can uh, I, I, what I want to show you is a it's a it's a it's an application with some with some real data, and um, this is COVID data, but I think particularly interesting type of data. And I want to show you how the, how the model works both in both directions. First, uh, how does it work when, when it comes to make predictions about, um, uh, about the, the vaccine labels? 
And the other one is how it can help to produce uh, 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 TCR repertoires based on counterfactual generation as, as I described before. Before I go into the details, I, I don't know if there is, if there is a, any question before I show you some, some results. Are there any questions? Yes, we have questions. Hi. So I was wondering if you can give us more insight about how to interpret the model. Since you have latent factor, you need to bind them or to link them to the original TSR. Or how do you do interpretation in this case? Yeah. So um, I think uh, I think the interpretation of the model will become clear in the in the experiment that I that I that I'm going to show. Um, so if that's fine with you. Uh, let me show you the results, and then we can repeat your question if you still have uh, any question about that. Because uh, everything was a bit abstract for now, but uh, I hope uh, uh, the experiment would, would clarify some of that. Okay, one more here. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get how do you encode this uh, TCR repertoire that you mentioned that would be like billions of uh, dimensions. Uh, so in a I, I cannot yeah, so in the, the yeah, that, that, that's an excellent that's an excellent question. Uh, so when you when you when you run this model, um, you you can you can run this model in, in fairly large repertoire. Uh, you don't run the model in in in, in the billion dimensions that the, that I mentioned at, at the beginning. So you do some 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 preprocessing because you have many public TCRs in which basically you have zero for everything. So that's relatively simple to simple to filter. Um, but what you can do with the model is uh, you don't need to do a very fine grid selection of, of TCRs. And um, so the model is fine with you having TCRs that are there and shouldn't be, like the one that I that I saw in the example, because of the, the invariances of the model are going to correct for that. Um, but you don't you don't you don't throw the billions of TCR in there. You do a pre-selection with hundreds of thousands of those. You put them in the model, and then even if you have in the bucket things that you shouldn't, the model is going to be you want to be fine with that. But I, I should have mentioned that. That's a, that's a very good question. Other questions? Yeah, I have more questions yeah. now. Are you? Okay. Okay. Uh, so if, if uh, there are no more questions, so let, let me show you the, the, the sample. So uh, we have been working with different type of data, in particular this uh, SARS-CoV uh, data. Um, so if you think about uh, the em envelope of the of the virus, it has four different type of proteins: uh, the membrane, the envelope, uh, the nucleocapsid, and the spike protein. Um, so when you and all these components are associated to different TCRs. Uh, so what is interesting about this example is that when you have an individual that uh, got a natural infection, uh, you can have expression of the TCRs in any of these proteins. When you were vaccinated, uh, you only have expression in the TCRs of one of those, right? So this is a figure that I've made trying to illustrate that. So if what you have there is uh, the whole uh, envelope of the of the virus. A part of it is the spike protein, and then you have the non-spike proteins. Uh, so in in this example, where I'm trying to illustrate, if you, if you got the vaccine, uh, all the TCRs that are going to trigger a response are going to be spike proteins. If you had a natural infection, you are going to have a spike and not expiring uh, uh, TCR associated to proteins that. Are, are, are going to be are going to be uh, expressed. Uh, so basically, this gives us with two labels uh, for the for the data set that we have. Whether uh, you uh, had uh, um, uh, uh, whether uh, you should expect uh, the spike protein or, or the non-spike protein to be one or zero, with, with one means that either you got the natural expansion or uh, the vaccine, and zero means that you got the vaccine. Uh, so we have three different groups of people, people that got the natural infection, so they could have TCR expressed in, in both components, people that were vaccinated, so they only 
uh, have PCR spread in the spike protein, and then we have healthy controls, uh, which are cases in which um, basically none, none of them, there is, there is no expression. Uh, so what we really wanted to understand uh, was how we can disentangle uh, the spike versus uh, non-spike labels. Uh, so we created three different experiments. First, when you have uh, cases and controls, where the cases are all natural infections and controls are vaccinated and healthy controls. Uh, then uh, another case where we have natural infections versus healthy controls only. And then the fifth case where you have natural infection unvaccinated uh, and the controls are only, only vaccinated. So what we expect to see is how the model can disentangle bet between its, uh, spikes and non-spikes uh, spike proteins. Uh, so these are these are the the, the results uh, for so now the, the model has two labels uh, spike or non-spike and then you have the the PCR repertoires. So what I'm showing here are the classification errors for the for the non-spike labels. Um, so for the non-spike labels and the three different use cases, so you see that overall uh, and unvaccinated have pretty much the same the same performance in the in the two baseline models. So you have a ESG this is logistic regression that was mentioned at the beginning. This is a fit forward neural network and this is a, the the Ariva model. But it's really in the vaccinated case where you see an improvement with the model with respect to, to the other two. And the reason why that is happening is because of the disentanglement that the model is doing in the in the latent space. In the cases you have a natural infection and vaccinated, so all the TCRs are uh, expressed. And in the control, you only have the, the, the vaccinated. So you have none of the TCRs that are expressed in the in the non-spike in the non-spike protein. And the model is able to capture that. Something that I have to say is that when it comes to making predictions with the with the model, beating the logistic regression is actually really hard. And when you think about the model that we have here, we have a model that uh, is both a generative model of uh, TCR repertoires and also a discriminative, a discriminative model. So all we are showing here is that this having two in one model will help us to do synthetic generation of repertoires, but it's not going to degrade the classification performance that we have when we make prediction, and we, we can we can even improve it in, in some cases. But obviously the model is going to need to make a compromise in the latent space of whether um, we have a model that is expressive for generating TCR repertoires or a model that is expressive for classifying the disease, and those two objectives can sometimes uh, be contradictory for the for the model. So it's already good that we don't lose any classification performance. We gain it in some cases at the expense of having a model that is more interpretable in the sense that, that, that I'm going to describe. Today. So this is the latent space. So for the two uh, labels that I have, the spike and the, and the non-spike protein. So, and we have the four groups. So what we have here at the bottom left are all the individuals from the control group. So they are they have low values in non-spike and, and the spike proteins because none of the TCRs are expressed. The interesting thing is that if we go up, what we see are the vaccinated group because they are expressed in the spike protein, but they have no expression in the non-spike protein. And with, when you think about the group that is uh, both sick and vaccinated or only sick, you we know that they have expression both in TCRs in the spike and no spike, so they are at the, at the top right. So the model is able to disentangle these two factors that were entangled at the beginning because of the way we were, we were mixing we were mixing the groups. Also, when we look at the top right figure, what we have as the background is basically the representation of all the TCRs in the late in the two latents, the spike and the, and the non-spike. And what we can see in the different groups is the different type of, of vaccines. And, and, and you see some structure, you see some structure there. They or are uh, targeting the spike protein, but you still see some, some differences across, across them. And this figure is just a uh, distribution of the of the, of the densities, which, which is not very interesting. 
Um, so something that I mentioned before is uh, how we can do con de facto generation. So something that we did is we started with the background population of PCR in the latent space of the of the model, and now we started with the control group. And what we did in the control group was to generate a counterfactual for the spike protein to go from zero to one, right? So when we do that, this is the counterfactual that we are generating. So we start having a PCR that are expressed in the spike protein. And now we do the journey again. And what we do is we go from a vaccinated to natural infection. So what we see is how the counterfactual we are generating go to the top right of the figure as we were observing for that group in the original representation. And then we complete the group and we go from natural infection to control and we switch the labels 1, 1 to 0, 0 and we come back to something origin to something very close to the original PCR that we were, we were representing. So this is given some consistency in the way we can navigate the latent space by generating these circular counterfactuals in which we move across the different groups and we come back to the, to the original one. In the paper, we have some further validation about, about how this is, how this is done um, with actual experiments of how antigens bind to, bind to TCL, but I'm not going to get into, into the details of that. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is a, some work that we have been doing uh, uh, or in, with this collaboration with 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 adaptive, uh, I have some other um, examples to tell you uh, to talk uh, to you about, uh, which relates to uh, mainly how uh, we can use real world evidence to improve precision treatments. But before I jump into that, and I know I have thirty minutes for it, um, I want to check if uh, you have any any question. I think we can go to the next part. Actually, okay. I, have a, I have a question. Actually, <laughs> I, I was wondering the where these classes are in um, in balance. Mm -hmm. Like, do you do you have that problem or? Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you have a class in balance. Uh, yeah, we. I mean, thinking about that, um, how you can. Uh, so you can correct that. The way we do it is when, when you have a particular uh, disease that you want to classify for, the, the control groups that you use are controls that are cases for, for other diseases. So that, that, that's the way it put together. So when you build your controls, you can think about building your controls in a, in a smart way in which the two things are not too imbalanced. Um, and one of the reasons why we look into this as well was because you can use this model to synthetically generate repertoires and labels, so you can actually rebalance some classification problems with synthetically generated repertoires. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's kind of the setup. The other question I have was you, in the tables, you were showing some standard deviation, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, repetitions over patients or that was yeah, yeah. So those are multiple repetitions over over subsamples of the day. Okay. Oh, there are some questions now. Cool. <laughs> Let me just go. Hi. Does your model have any predictive capacity for disease conditions which directly affect the T cell receptor repertoire, like leukemia? Uh, say again, please. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you completely well. Uh, does the model have any predictive capacity for disease conditions which directly affect TCR repertoire, like leukemia? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So these experiments were for COVID. Uh, there have been other experiments, but I'm not aware of anything with leukemia. Okay. Yeah, one more here. So just the. A... 
So just a practical question. Uh, I'm not sure if all the atlases that you got were from the same source, but if not, uh, did you have batch effects? And if yes, uh, how did you deal with them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so we, we do see some batch effects. Um, the data sets that, uh, that we build and from, from different cohorts also that are collected in, in different places. Um, we try to, as I mentioned before, we, we build the, uh, we build the controls in a way that is the best as much as you can, we can for the, for, for, for building, for building the, the models. But the, the batch effects are there and are part of the robustness effects that I was, that I was, that I was mentioning before. That's a, that's a still an, an, an open, an open question. Uh, but yeah, the, the batch effects are there. Any more questions? I don't think we have more questions, Mayor. Cool. I'll, I'll jump to, into the into the next into the next part. Um, I, I'm going to go back now to the to the data availability that we have to uh, push the boundaries of, of the medical the medical care. And I I, I want to be talking about about uh, real world evidence um, and what do we mean by it. Uh, so real world evidence is mainly like a pharma term, and it really means uh, general world data that has been collected out of uh, randomized control trials, and that can be used to accelerate uh, uh, personalized new new treatment. Um, so what is interesting about uh, real world evidence is how it can be used to expand the questions that we can answer with a with a randomized with a randomized control trial. And what is interesting as well is that even the FDA is looking at how uh, real world evidence can be used to uh, speed up and simplify and reduce cost in, in the approval of, of some treatments. Uh, so this is a, a figure that represents how the FDA is looking at real world evidence uh, for all these problems. Um, obviously, it's not, not everything is black and white. Uh, there are different setups that go from having a completely randomized experiment to a completely non-randomized, non-interventional uh, study or things in between like uh, pragmatic trials or, or, or things like that. So home, the, the more we move away uh, having a completely predefined randomized control trial, the more we can rely on all the sources of data that we have available to try to generate uh, biological insights uh, about uh, uh, about the questions that, that that we may want to that we may want to answer. Um, so I, I just want to stop um, a minute and uh, compare um, what we can collect from a randomized control trial and the data that we can collect from um, uh, what we call real world real world data. So when we think about uh, uh, randomized control trial data, we are thinking about data that is completely random, randomized uh, is data that typically has a very high quality and that has been collected with the idea of running a differential um, analysis between between the between two drugs and is data that uh, has a very, very strong uh, regulatory validity. Uh, however, uh, when we think about uh, randomized control trial data, randomized control trial data um, doesn't represent Necessarily, the whole population in which the drug is going to be uh, is going to be used, and that's because uh, collecting patients for for a trial is can be very very expensive because of the eligibility criteria of the, of the trials, and I'll, I'll be talking uh, about that in, in five minutes. Um, also, the, the sample sizes are relatively small uh, compared to data that we can collect by looking, for instance, at electronic health records in, in hospitals. Running uh, randomized control trials is very expensive, and it takes so it also takes a lot of a lot of time and effort. So now we, when we move to the other spectrum and we think about real world data that are electronic health records that we can get from hospitals, uh, data from wearables, medical images, genetic data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this data typically covers better the, the the whole population in which we may. Uh, want to use uh, certain drugs. Um, it's also larger, uh, of a larger sample size. Uh, it's easier to collect. 
but it has some drawbacks. Um, so the first one is that this data that is not collected with the idea of running a particular analysis, so it's observational data that is typically very unstructured, um, is definitely not, not randomized. Um, because of that, it has a low regulatory validity, and that's why it has triggered all the discussions, in particular about the FDA, of how and when uh, real world data can 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 be used in the in the as uh, uh, RCT data is used to make decisions about the about the use of drugs. So this is a this is a comparative analysis between randomized controlled trial data and real world data from the data type, cost, and regulatory validity. But something that I that I that I want to discuss is also how we can compare these two types of data sets from what I'm calling the hypothesis space point of view. And what I want to highlight here is pretty much the type of answers that we can answer with these two types, two types of data. So when we think about uh, randomized controlled trial data, we are typically thinking about data that are used for a differential analysis of the two drugs. But when we think about real world data, we can think about a much larger hypothesis space because we can think about post-market analysis of drugs, we can think about trial selectivity, PPD optimization, post-market phenotypic analysis. Um, so we can think about cases in which these two hypotheses overlap, so we can use real-world data to do a differential analysis between, between the two drugs, but we can do way more with that. For instance, to give you a specific example, we can think about a particular randomized controlled trial that has been running for a year, and having a a measure of the effect of one drug versus a control group for patients that were enrolled in the trial for that particular year. And that's, that's it. That's the end of the study. But when we look at electronic health records in a hospital, for instance, we can look at uh, period windows of one year, but we can also have a longer follow-up of the patient. So we can think about long-term outcomes, long-term effects, or adversarial effects of, of drugs in, in, the, in the long term. So that's what I mean by, by a larger um, hypothesis space. So the question is, well, how, we, how can we combine these two sources of information, the information that we have from trials with information that we have from, from real world evidence to supercharge the, the hypothesis space and the question that, that, we, can, that we can answer. So um, the, this can work at, at multiple levels. Uh, so this can work at the drug discovery level, at the clinical trial level, and at the post-market analysis level. So when we think about drug discovery, we can think about target identification, drug repurposing. When we think about the clinical trial, we can think about whether the, the criteria of selecting the patients is the most optimal or not. Uh, virtual trials, we can think about um, synthetic controls, for instance, when you have arms with, uh, uh, when you have trials with, with, with only one arm, how it could be a, a synthetic control uh, from real world data. We can think of pragmatic trials that are trials that are run in hospitals. For instance, imagine that um, a hospital has uh, two different uh, procedures to uh, give oxygen to patients, right? Uh, procedure A, procedure B. Uh, sometimes what the hospitals do is they run a pragmatic trial, they run a randomized experiment in which they allocate patients randomly to the two, they compare the two arms um, and decide uh, which procedure is better, and that's the one that, that, that they adopt. But obviously, we, you have data in the hospital that has already been collected between, before running this trial. So you could think about um, influencing the way that pragmatic trial is run by the information that you that you already have in the, in the hospital, or even uh, decide that it's not, it's not even necessary. And also, we can think about fairness in trials. So when when we uh, when we get the results from, from from trials, they are typically aggregated results for a particular population that was eligible for the trial, but obviously you can always look into some populations and see if a, if a particular subgroup uh, didn't have the effect that was reported in the, in, the, in the whole trial. So we are talking here about clinical trials. We can also think about post-market analysis. Um, we can think about patient profiling. We can think about following uh, the end-to-end -end journey of a, of, a, of a patient and thinking about long-term outcomes, as I was, as I was mentioning before. So when we think about real-world evidence, there are a few success uh, stories. 
Um, and what is the, the, the sample of, 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 this, of this drug? Um, so, so when you think about breast cancer, uh, so, uh, so this, uh, in grant, so this, this drug was used, um, in, there was a randomized control trial in which, uh, this drug was used to treat, um, um, breast cancer in women, but, uh, men can also have breast cancer, but, uh, the, this drug was, wasn't approved for men because there was no men in the, in the, in the randomized control trial, but when doctors were receiving men with breast cancer, they were, uh, giving this, giving them this drug because that that was the the, the only thing the only thing they had. After that, uh, there was so much evidence that the drug was also working in men that just using data that were collected in the hospital from the clinical practice um, allowed the FDA to reapprove the drug in the male population without having to to run a trial. So this is considered a success story of how um, we can use observational data uh, to complement a randomized control trial when the, when the evidence is, is good enough. Um, obviously, there are, there are blockers when, when doing this. And one of the main blockers is that when we look at electronic health records, most of the relevant information is in the form of text report. Uh, so what I have in the, in the, in the slide there is um, a, a patient, uh, a simulated patient um, that is part in, in, in real patients uh, uh, that in the electronic health records of real patients that we work with, uh, in which what we see is the different reports that were collected at different time points of the of the patient of the patient journey. So obviously the hospitals record structured data in some form and that's relatively easy to access, but a lot of the relevant information that is needed to make informed decisions about how a particular patient is going to respond to a drug is hidden in all, in all these notes. So, and I'm going to give you an example. So um, uh, maybe some of you know uh, uh, Flatiron Health, the Flatiron data set. Uh, so Flatiron was a, was a company that um, hired thousands of curators to manually go over electronic health records and build a curated data, data set that they could use to, to generate real, real world evidence. Um, so this company was acquired for almost $2 billion by Roche because Roche uh, considered that it was really like a, like a gold mine uh, uh, that could help them to, 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 develop, to develop the drug. So the question is, well, how can we empower curators uh, with tools that will speed this process without uh, having to manually create the, the data set. Obviously, we live uh, in the era of AI, and uh, there, there is a lot to say about uh, language models, but in the, in the team uh, in Microsoft uh, that, that I joined about a year ago, um, uh, they have been using uh, language models to structure biomedical texts in, in multiple in multiple ways. So one of the uh, methods that, that uh, they developed already when I when I joined the when I joined the group was uh, PubMed Bear that is a bear type of model uh, trained on all the data from PubMed Bear. And something you can do with these models is uh, use them to structure electronic health records and to go from an structured text to some attributes that you can use for your modeling. So you can uh, speed up the process of creating the, of creating the databases. And now of course there is, there is GPT-4 and there is a lot of discussion of how uh, GPT-4 can be used in the, in the biomedical, in the biomedical domain as well. So I want to mention uh, uh, this case study, which is uh, a clinical trial matching. This is not my work, but I think it's very relevant and I, and I wanted, and I wanted to mention it. So this is clinical trial.gov. So this is a repository of, uh, um, uh, information about clinical trials that have finished and that are ongoing. So if you ever know, need to know about a clinical trial, this is, this is the place, this is the place to go. So what I wanted to highlight here is when you look into the reports of these trials, they are really, really, really complex. So the eligibility criteria that patients need to satisfy in order to be part of a, of a trial is extremely complex. So which means that whenever a trial is run, there is really a risk of the trial failing because um, 
not having enough patients that will be part of it, and therefore you won't have uh, significant results and that will um, uh, block the, the drug to, to, get it into, to get it into the market. Um, so this is, uh, and it's considered that about 25% of the trial failed due to insufficient patients. So that's, 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 a, that's a really, really large number. So this is a, a, an example of Mark Tenenbaum uh, who had um, um, a large state uh, melanoma and that was uh, given a particular trial and saved his life because he had access uh, to one uh, experimental trial that was running um, uh, when when he was in a terminal state of the of the disease and he saved his life. So one of the work that um, we have been doing in the in the group, as I mentioned before, this is not my my own group, but my own work, but is a um, uh, is is related to it, is uh, to work with Providence, uh, which is a network of hospitals in the in the U.S. to build a clinical matching trial tool that use language model to structure electronic health records and do a quick matching to ongoing trials. Um, so uh, people like the patient that I saw before can have access to uh, treatments very, very fast and they can they can they can save their life. So this is a this is synthetic data and this is an illustration of the tool, but this is currently running in Providence and is helping to identify patients uh, that could join a, a trial and help uh, then to have better better outcome. Um, um, something I want to mention in the, in the last ten minutes is uh, how you can use uh, real world evidence to go one step ahead. So in the sense, uh, so you can you can use um, a structure electronic health record to assign patients to trials. But something that you can also do is when when you have that, uh, you can think about using real-world data uh, structured from electronic health records to directly simulate a trial. And simulating a trial is not very interesting by itself because the evidence of the, of the trial was already there. So you build a model with observational data that you extract from electronic health records. It's like, it's pretty much the same evidence. But the important part of that is that when we were talking before about the hypothesis spaces, in order to gain confidence in how um, models that we train in real world data uh, can be used to generate patient level counterfactuals or to think about the specifics of populations. Um, we need to validate them. These are causal models, and the, the only way of validating a causal model is by some external validation of some ground truth. And a way in which we can use the randomized control trials is by making sure that the models that we build on real world data give us the same answer that is already there and that. Uh, has been validated by by an RCT. So this is really like like a like a first step is a validation step in which if we are able to have consistent um, evidence uh, to the one that has been already provided by a by a by a trial, then we can trust our models to answer uh, questions uh, beyond 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 that. So this is a way of combining observational and interventional data. Um, which is, uh, you could think about having a model that uses the two, uh, but in this case, what we are just doing is to use data from the RCT as an oracle, as a ground truth to validate the IWE, the, the model, the, the, the model is based on the, on the electronic, the electronic health records. Obviously, when, when doing this, and I don't have time to go into the details, but there are a lot of subtleties and, and things that you need to take into, into account. And um, there are a lot of causal assumptions that you need to take into account that sometimes are broken in the, in the observational data. Uh, you need to correct the data. You need to make sure that all this, all this is in place. Um, a way of doing it is, well, you can have your model, you can simulate your trial, but you should have also uh, ways of validating all these assumptions to make sure that when it comes to extrapolating data beyond uh, the simulation of the trial, that, that's something that you can, that you can do. Um, I don't have time to go a lot into, uh, into the details, but you can think about what we mean by simulation and control trial is, so we have an RCT in the RCT because everything is randomized between cases and controls. 
um, you had randomized control trial and then you directly have to your response. In this case, what I have our survivor course for the for the for the response. So something you can use as a metric of the effect of the drug. Some overestimate effect is uh, the the hazard ratio between 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 cases and, and controls. Um, and when you think about real world data, where you have some treatment, you have a response, but you also have some latent cobites that you assume have generated your electronic medical record that you want to use as confounders to make sure that um, the cases and controls um, are, 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 are comparable. So that, that you remove the effect of the of cobites and that you don't fool yourself by thinking that a drug has a particular response um, uh, when, when, when it does, uh, which is pretty much the similar effect that we were thinking about when we had the, 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 TC, the TCR. So you want to um, you want to, to make sure that you correct for, for those for those effects. And then when are you happy when you build these models? As I mentioned before, uh, you can use the RCT to validate the models from the real world data. Um, so when the when the when the hazard ratio that you compute from the data uh, from uh, the electronic health records is similar or close enough or statistically significant or statistically close enough to the one that you have from the RCT, then you are happy. Then you are happy with it. So this is a very high level description of how you can you can simulate an RCT. You have some data curation pipeline where you go from electronic health records to some 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 database. Uh, then you need to go into your database and do some uh, trial matching. So you need to select from the database patients that could have been eligible from from a from a previous trial. And this step can be quite involved depending on the trial. As I saw you before, some trials have very complex ways of selecting the data. Then you need to predict your outcome and you will have some COPS model and you can do all sorts of interesting causal uh, machine learning type of approaches. The simplest one would be just to use some inverse propensity weighting and, and rebalance the groups um, to make sure that they are they are compatible and then you re remove the effect of the covariates and then you see if you if you get some hazard ratio in the test in the in the in the model that is comparable to the one that you have in the RCT you Happy. Obviously, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of assumptions. You need to select the confounders. Uh, you you need to have a lot of domain knowledge uh, to build to build these models. But that is uh, but this is something that, that is doable, and it's doable because some people have done it before. So in this in this uh, uh, in this paper, they are simulating a bunch of a bunch of trials using the Flatiron dataset. So the dataset that had been automatically created already. And they, I mean, I, I don't have time to show the results, but they have some very good results and they even go farther and show that some of the eligibility criteria that were used in the trial were, were redundant. Uh, so there is this work in which what they do is they go one step ahead and they use some pre-specified covariate with um, some interpretable covariate that they extract from some representation of the, of the, of the text. And so essentially what they saw is that when you add those covariates uh, that are basically tokens that you can you can find in the text with some very very uh, simple representation of, of the tokens on df pdf representation uh, uh, you can you can just augment the number of covariates and, and you can actually interpret that uh, on top of all the covariates that you thought uh, will help you to deconfound and to have a, a model based on observational data that can simulate an RCT, you can you can do you can do better. I don't have time to go into 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 the details, but basically what they saw here is that in a model in which you only use the structured data versus a model in which you inject these interpretable confounders, you can get closer to this vertical line that is the, the ground truth given by the RCT. And here they are highlighting which tokens um, are significant in the model, so you can you can start having a better interpretation of what is going on. I don't have time to go into the detail, but we have been working on this. Um, and one thing that we have been doing is use language models to uh, scale the way we can simulate RCTs uh, by combining the structuring pipelines 
of uh, going from the electronic health records to some curated data sets from, uh, and take it from there to build some causal models to simulate RCDs at the scale because you don't have to manually manually curate anything. Uh, so these are, so we are we are putting some some work on this together that will be out uh, probably in the in the coming weeks. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, please reach out. I don't have time to go into into the details, but I have time to thank all my collaborators uh, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm very happy I can work with all. Uh, these people on, on, on this project, and I'll be more than happy of taking any final thoughts or questions that, that you may have just, just to wrap up. Thank you, Javier. <laughs> Do we have questions? I think we already have asked questions during the talk. Oh, there is one question. Hi, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there's any connection between the trial at LCT emulation you're doing there and the way that, say, something like Mendelian randomization or other stuff like that attempts to emulate a trial if there's like a comparison that can be made between the two methods. I sorry uh, because of the echo, I couldn't I couldn't understand the the question. Would you mind to repeat again? Oh yeah, um, I was wondering if there's a connection for emulating the trials with uh, Mendelian randomization or other instrumental variable analysis, as that sort of also attempts to randomize to emulate a trial. But that's. Connection to some resources. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. So I think if you if you write it in the chat, I I should be able to read it. Maybe I'm I'm closer to the mic. So I think the question was whether there's a link to Mendelian randomization. Uh huh. So or whether it's also an approach to trying to uh, simulate randomization, non-randomized population. Ah, I see. Uh, that maybe. Uh, I, I'm I'm not aware of I'm not aware of it, and I would love to learn. That if, uh, if that, that's that's the case. Um, so in the inverse propensity score that I that I saw, basically what you do is uh, you build a model, you build a model from the confounders to the to the treatment, and you downweight um, cases in which you can clearly predict from the confounders whether they are in the control or the or the treatment group uh, because they are individuals that are far from being randomized. And you overweight those, which probability goes to 0 0.5 because those are indistinguishable and they could have been more likely selected for the treatment or the, or the control group. I don't know if the randomization that, the, that you mentioned uh, will do an effect like that, but I, I, I would love to, to learn about that if, if that's the case. Great, thanks. So um, one problem with software analysis and trials is kind of double dipping in the trial data. You know, because if you uh, basically you can overfit the trial data if you try too many uh, software analyses. So do you think your synthetic data would be a good way to do model selection prior to looking at real trial data? Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a very that's a very good point. Yeah, so we something we have tried to do is and um, yeah, I think we will will be will be putting this in archive in a in a few days is trying to split all the trials that we want to simulate in two groups and use a group as a as a way of validating that we are doing the right thing and then we simulate other group of uh, trials without knowing anything about them and we still see that we can do it. Um, something that we look at is like because you can have a hazard ratio and say, oh, this is similar to this. I think it's way more interesting when you cannot simulate a trial than when you can actually can simulate a trial. Uh, so something we have been looking at is some postdoc analysis in which we look at uh, properties of the simulation that tells us that something is going wrong. Uh, for instance, things like, well, first of all, you need to have 
a population in the real world data that matches at least in high level statistics to the population of the RCT. If that doesn't happen, whatever aggregated metric that you have for the two is simply not, not comparable, right? So we observe that in some cases we cannot simulate, but actually we are looking at two very distinct populations, so, so we sue them. For things like doing refutation analysis for the causal models, you start in, do you sensitivity analysis for, for some of the models and see if the, the response that you have is very sensible or not sensitive or not with respect to some parameters. So there is a lot of to discuss, it's not a one-off, uh, so there is a lot of nuances and things that you need to to take to take into into account. So yeah, that, that that that's a that's a very good point. It's very easy to overfit and wanted to say, well, I can simulate everything. I think it's it's, it's way more subtle than that. No questions. So I, I don't. Oh, does it work? Uh, regarding your last slide on, on the scalable RCT simulation, you were talking about language models for electronic health record data curation. So these are uh, specialized language models for biomedical and clinical data or just general language model like GPD? Yeah, so there are, uh, there are different ways of looking into it. Um, so there, are, there is some evidence in the literature that the specialized models in the medical domain can help you to structure the data, the data better, um, but now we see the capabilities of models like GPT-4 that, although they are uh, having trained data in the general domain, they, they have some good um, um, performance in the specific domains as well. I think this is this is an open an open question, really. Uh, no, nobody really knows. I think everyone is trying to explore and to figure out this with all the new generation of, of language models. Okay, thank you. No questions? Okay, so let's let's thank uh, Javier again. Thank you. Thank you.